Hello, everyone. My name is Linnea Anderson. On behalf of the First Fridays Committee and the Archives and Special Collections Department, welcome to First Fridays Online. Today's presentations will also be posted later on the University of Minnesota Library's YouTube channel, so you should be able to access them within the next few weeks. First Fridays is a monthly series of presentations made possible by a generous gift from Governor Elmer L. Anderson and Mrs. Eleanor Anderson in honor of former library director, Dr. Edward B. Stanford. The presentations are based on materials in the university libraries, archives, and special collections. A special thank you today to Alan and Jason from Middle English Interpreting, who will be providing ASL interpretation for today's presentations. If you have any questions for our speakers today, you should submit them using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Please use the Q&A function and not the chat so that we can keep track of your questions. You can submit your questions at any time, but we will hold them until the end of the presentation as time allows. We will now pause for a land acknowledgement. The Archives and Special Collections Department acknowledges that the University of Minnesota Twin Cities is located on the traditional, ancestral, and contemporary lands of the Dakota and Anishinaabe peoples. We acknowledge that the United States government failed to uphold the 1805, 1837, and 1851 treaties with the Dakota Nation, which made possible the founding of our university. This land acknowledgement is one of the ways in which we work to educate the campus and community about this land and our relations with it and each other. We are committed to ongoing efforts to recognize, support, and advocate for Indigenous nations and peoples. Our presentations today are The Adventure of the Pandemic Posts, presented by Tim Johnson, curator of the Sherlock Holmes Collections, and Telling Trans Stories on the Radio, the Treader Transgender Oral History Podcast Project, presented by Merle Beam, Assistant Professor of Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies at Virginia Commonwealth University, currently serving as the oral historian for the Treader Trans Oral History Project, and Cassius Adair, lead producer of the podcast Transcripts. He is also a freelance story editor and a visiting assistant professor of media, culture, and communication at New York University. Our first presentation today is The Adventure of the Pandemic Post by Tim Johnson. The COVID-19 pandemic offered an opportunity to share artwork on social media from the Sherlock Holmes collections by renowned illustrator Frederick Dorr Steele. What started out as a simple work from home exercise in sharing soon turned into a chance to boost morale, inspire action, and subtly comment on current events. Enjoy posts and art and track the evolution of these posts and how they were received by followers on social media. Thanks, Tim. All right, let's see if we can get the technology to work for us. <clears throat> you should be <clears throat> seeing my first slide now, I believe. So, so as <clears throat> Linnea said, uh, what I wish to do today is to uh, share some of these posts and artwork, uh, as well as give you some sense of how these communications evolved and how they were received by followers on the social media platform, Twitter. I began working from home the first week of March 2020, following a week-long illness that may or may not have been the novel coronavirus. Campus shut down before I had a chance to return to my office. For the majority of the last 335 days, I've been working from home. On March 18th of last year, a post from Will Hansen, a colleague at the Newberry Library in Chicago, popped up on Twitter. 
using digital versions of a postcard collection from the Newberry, Will was going to take us on a tour around the world. He thought the tour might take a couple of weeks. Little did he know that his tour would last well into August, the 19th to be exact. A few days later, I tweeted Will a short note of appreciation. At the same time, an idea was bumping around inside my head. I thought we might be able to do something similar with images from our Sherlock Holmes collections using images from our U Media discovery tool, I started to grab artwork by noted illustrator Frederick Dorr Steele. The next day, March 24th, I posted the first of what has now run to over 180 images of Steele's artwork, taken primarily from the Philip S. and Mary Kaler Hench collection found within the larger Holmes collections. Appropriately, my post began with a book plate. As you can see, I initially saw this exercise as a diversion, something to bring interest or joy. It became much more. I wanted to share Steele's art But I also wanted to provide a little glimpse into Steele as a person. Here we see a portrait, a self-portrait on the cover of The Players, a bulletin Steele edited for the Players Club in New York City. These posts sometimes collided with realities from the pandemic. Too many people were dying in New York when I posted this in late March. Other posts scattered throughout the year added to our portrait of Steele as a person. He enjoyed a round of golf with friends now and then. And he wrote this little ditty. This is little Freddie Steele, who knows just how you fellows feel to find your form so awful sad. Believe me, his is just as bad. Now a couple of technical things to observe in this example of a place card. I tried to embed the Holmes and Libraries Twitter handles into as many of these posts as possible as a way to remind readers of our online identity and to also alert the library's communication staff that another post was up. Often they would retweet, retweet or like a post something that broadened our audience. I also tried to add a pearl, which is a permanent uh, internet link to each post that would take a reader to the original image in UMedia if they clicked on it. Here's another steel self-portrait, along with a few other posts I'll show that shed a little light on the Steele family and what was happening in my life with work and the libraries. Steele's uh, dinner place cards are a delight. They also provided me with a means for updating folks on the status of the library and what became a continuous plea to wear a mask, wash your hands, and physically distance. Here, uh, the trees modeled proper behavior in their spacing. I'm not sure what they did in regard to hand washing or masking. Obviously, a huge part of Steele's portfolio included his illustrations of Mr. Holmes and scenes from the Sherlockian canon of 60 stories. Here are some of those posts, beginning with this one from The Dying Detective. Here I combined a reference to Holmes and his personal reference library and files with the library's digital resources and online reference. Safe and well, stay safe 
and well has been another constant refrain. I wanted to make sure we also included some of Steele's covers for Collier's. This is one of my favorites. Holmes' pensive mood fit the times. And did you know bike sales rose during the pandemic? Here I combined a Holmes image with a little bit about Steele's cut and paste method. In another version, Steele removed Holmes entirely from the right side of the illustration. Later, I took advantage of this vacant space in a slightly different version of this scene from Thor Bridge to insert the now famous photograph of Senator Bernie Sanders at the inauguration. My contribution added to the many Bernie memes on the internet. This one with a Sherlockian twist. At one point on the Memorial Day weekend, the weight of those events surrounding the murder of George Floyd became too much. Uh, my anger was and is real and deep. That grief continued uh, into the next day and the next week. With grief came resolve. Meanwhile, the pandemic raged on. My daughter, my mother and son-in-law are nurses. My daughter-in-law is a physician assistant. My aunt was a surgeon. You can understand then why I was drawn to this particular steel image. My son-in-law has frequently worked COVID wards during the pandemic. This post was a way to say that my heart is with him and every other frontline healthcare worker. How were these posts over those many months received? I'd say enthusiastically, appreciatively. And these posts also benefited from the work of an individual extremely knowledgeable about Frederick Dorr Steele's work, a fellow librarian by the name of Andrew Malik. I'll give you a couple links to Andrew's steel exhibition catalogs that he did in this following slide. So here are the citations if you're interested to uh, two of Andrew's exhibition catalogs on steel. You can follow the links here or find them on the Sherlock Holmes Collection website under the exhibit catalogs link on the left sidebar. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, brief adventure of the pandemic posts. I didn't get to talk about the many Christmas cards Steele created or his time on Monhegan Island in Maine or his other illustrations beyond Holmes. It is a rich portfolio and we are thankful to the Henches and others who collected Steele's work over the years. We're also grateful to the members of the Steele family who have informed our work over this period of time. We have a few more pieces of Steele's work to share online. In all, there are about 250 images that we have digitized of Steele's work on the UMedia website. I hope you'll explore those drawings and this extensive resource from the university libraries. So it's now my pleasure to introduce our second presentation, Telling Trans Stories on the Radio, the Treader Transgender Oral History Podcast Project. Our presenters are Merle Beam and Cassius Adair. 
Merle Beam is an assistant professor of gender, sexuality, and women's studies at Virginia Commonwealth University, currently serving as the oral historian for the Treader Trans Oral History Project. Kasha Sader is the lead producer of the podcast, Transcripts. He is also a freelance story editor and a visiting assistant professor of media, culture, and communication at New York University. In June 2020, the Treader Collection launched a new project, an audio podcast that uses interviews from the Treader Transgender or History Project to tell stories about the history of the struggle for transgender rights. In this presentation, Merle and Cassius will use stories from the project to explore the ways in which trans movements for justice offer unexpected lessons for everyone seeking to transform the world. Merle and Cassius. Hi, you guys, and welcome. Thank you for um, including me and Cassius in the First Friday's event. I'm excited to share with you um, a little bit about the Transcript Podcast Project and the broader oral history project from which it draws. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now. So some of you may be more familiar with the Treader Transgender Oral History Project than others. So I'm gonna to present today as if you are not familiar with it and take the opportunity to introduce you to this amazing project and also to the podcast um, as well, which will have the opportunity to listen to a few minutes of, and um, I encourage you to listen to the rest of it as time allows. So the Treader Trans Oral History Project began in 2015 and um, is funded by the Tawani Foundation who supported the hire of Andrea Jenkins who now is um, the vice president of Minneapolis City Council. And at the time she was elected was the first black trans woman elected to public office in the US. Prior to being elected, she um, worked on the Oral History Project from its founding up in, until uh, 2017. And in that time, she collected almost 200 oral histories with transgender people and gender fabulous people all over the US. Although the project at that time had a, had a specific focus on the upper Midwest, as well as people who are often left out of um, the archive of trans stories, meaning elders, trans folks of color, immigrant trans folks. I came on um, in 2019 to take the project into its second phase. This second phase is intended to look at the transformative power and vision of trans movements through activists telling the stories of their work um, and their lives. By the end of this spring, we will have collected an additional 60 interviews of which 25 are available now and our uh, fantastic um, uh, project assistant, Myra Bill and Fibs is currently transcribing additional interviews that will be made live over the coming weeks and months. But we realized as we began to reflect on this now quite considerable collection that it was not being used as um, as sufficiently as we wanted. We recognize that oral history is an incredibly important addition to um, the archive, in part because the written archive, as all of you are, are, I'm sure, aware, is often a record of powerful institutions, right? And those powerful institutions have tended to regard queerness or gender nonconformity as problems to be managed. And so there's little documentation in the written archive of trans or gender fabulous people telling their own stories. And mainstream representation of trans people still um, tends to represent trans and gender nonconforming people as tragic or dangerous or sinful. And even positive representations tend to be incredibly narrow. 
um, white trans folks are overrepresented. Um, trans folks tend to um, be a, a very narrow band of, of trans embodiment, whiter than the trans community at large, skinnier, more within a very narrow age bracket, right? We wanted to gather and represent the variety and diversity of trans experiences and tell expansive, complicated stories, stories that disrupt and challenge um, the dominant ideas about what it means to be gender fabulous. And we feel like those stories are so valuable and so important that we want to make sure people are hearing them. We began to gather some information about how the oral histories are being used um, via the all powerful Google Analytics. And what it was telling us is that the oral history collection, as valuable as it is, is a bit overwhelming for the lay listener. It now is hundreds of hours of interview footage and it's hard for a lay listener to make sense of it. Um, what's significant? What should people listen to first? Why? Um, how are the oral histories related to one another? Um, how can people begin to make sense of this wide variety of, um, of documentary footage, of interview footage? And because they're so overwhelming, they simply don't have the reach in popular culture that we would like to see for these narratives. And so we began to think about how we could reach more listeners um, listeners with a, a wide variety of familiarity with um, trans people and issues, meaning not just the PhD researcher who is pro probably the primary user of the oral histories um, currently, um, someone who has a funded opportunity to really sift through archival um, material and sit with the oral histories for hours and hours and hours. And so um, when Cassius Adair, who at that time was, a, was working on the NPR show with good reason, uh, reached out in his community to see if anyone had some amazing trans content and wanted to partner on a podcast project, it was exactly um, the, the conversation that I and Rachel Matson, the curator of the Treader collection was wanting to have. So Cassius and I have been working together for the past year to produce both a pilot episode and then seek additional funding for additional episodes. And we are at, at the very tail end of putting the finishing touches on the second episode, which will focus on trans experiences of houselessness and housing justice activism in the US South. Um, and we have had a remarkable time using these oral histories to tell stories that are accessible for a wide variety of listeners and that are available to people both who want to download and listen to podcasts and also have been featured on NPR um, and so have a, have a wide reach through the terrestrial radio. And so what I'd like to do is um, I'm gonna shift to the website that we produced for the first episode of the podcast and invite you all to listen with me for the first you know, five to eight minutes of the podcast. Obviously, I would love to be able to share the entire thing with you. And I encourage you to go to the website, transcriptspodcast-umn.edu and um, invite you to listen to the whole thing. What we're gonna do is listen to the first five minutes or so so that you can begin to hear the stories of some of the activists we featured in the story. You'll hear from Lasaya Wade, who's a Chicago-based activist and the executive director of an organization called the Brave Space Alliance. You'll hear from Diamond Stiles, who's based in Tal Dallas, Texas, and is the executive director of Black Trans Women, Inc. Um, and we may get into hearing from Gabriel Foster, who's the founder of the Trans Justice Funding Project and is based in Seattle. Ricky Manzala, who used to work with the organization Fierce, and Dean Spade, who was the founder of the Sylvia Rivera Law Project based in New York City. So I'm gonna go ahead and press play and invite us all to listen uh, to the first five or eight minutes. It pops in my head 
It was a clip of Nina Simone sitting at a table. She said, I never felt liberation, but in this moment, I'm around other black people. I feel liberated. That's Lasaya Wade. She's talking to oral historian Merle Beam in fall 2019, and she's talking about freedom. It's always going to be a bill that needs to be paid. It's always going to be a water bill that's being turned off. It's always going to be a car note that you missed. It's always going to be that particular stress. But I feel liberated when I'm around other Black people. I feel liberated when I'm around other trans people. From the Treader Transgender Oral History Project, this is Transcripts a new podcast series about how trans activists are changing the world. Now there are like, some incredible um, trans women of color activists up here with me. Yes, it's here for them. The state of transness in America, the state of blackness in America, the state of sexuality in America, everything that I care about, housing, discrimination, education. Sharing space, sharing story, sharing experience. And that, that is the work. That is the work that I'm so honored to stand here and lift up for you today. My name is Andrea Jenkins. And I'm Merle Bean. I'm the one who spoke with Lasaya, who you heard at the top of the show, and all the other voices you'll hear in this episode. I work on an oral history project where I collect stories of trans activists from all over the U.S. I actually started that oral history project back in 2015. I wanted to hear the stories of trans people in their own words and preserve those stories for other people to learn from. And I'm so glad you did, because the stories are amazing. And those stories are especially important right now because so many trans people are dreaming of a new world, one without gender discrimination or racism or economic injustice. And we're figuring out what exactly it's going to take to get there. We've been asking folks, what are the tools you're using to make change? Who's leading the struggle? And how in the world are people getting enough money to live and do all of this work. So in this pilot episode, we're gonna tackle a question that sounds simple, but is actually really big. Is life actually getting better for trans people? Like, it's not just Lasaya's vision of liberation, of being around people like her, other black people, other trans people that got us thinking. It's also what she was saying about her daily struggles. It's always going to be a bill that needs to be paid. It's always going to be a water bill that's being turned off. So when I interviewed Lasaya, I asked her, what about the fact that things seem to be getting better for some people? How can you, what's your sense of that paradox? That like, at the same time we have this visibility, there's also been more Black trans women killed last year than I think ever in my lifetime. How do you explain that? What do you think is going on? We allowed our enemies to know where we're at. We have allowed our enemies to know where we're at. This answer was so compelling that I wanted to back up and learn more. How did we arrive at a place where some trans people, especially white trans folks, people like me, think of things as getting better, but life is actually getting a lot more dangerous for Black trans women like Lasaya? To answer that question, we talked to so many different people. And we want you to hear their stories directly from them. You'll hear folks describing the barriers that they face, but you'll also hear what they are doing to change things. That decision to try to change things, to devote your life to a larger struggle, it isn't always an easy choice. Activism wasn't exactly Lasaya's plan A. For a long time, she was just trying to live her life. I was director of communications in Tennessee, Nashville, Tennessee, at Bell South when it was slowly switching over to AT and T. For the price, plus digital satellite TV with more HD channels than cable, all for under ninety nine dollars a month. Bell South, call today. Good job after I graduated college. I'm like, oh, I 
male one. She wasn't out as trans at work. As a trans feminine person, it's easier to live as a stealth person, and especially trying to live a healthy life or also live a wealthy life. And what I mean by wealthy is going to school, getting a thriving job, not just a surviving job, but a thriving job, a good career. But about a year into the job, she rode into work after she had been out the night before at the club. You know, I'm still young. I'm still vibracious. I wanted to have fun. So I came back to work that following Monday with my stuff on my desk packed up. One of Lasaya's cis gay co-workers had seen her at the club, and from there he figured out she was trans. Then he outed her to the rest of the office. The co-worker that wanted my job told my boss at that time that I was a trans person. And it was multiple layers to that, right? I was a Black person in a high position at a company that that is not really known for a Black person to be that high in a position that I was in. And also, I was a trans person. And then they fired me for non-disclosure of my transness. Lasaya was fired for being Black, trans, and powerful. And there was nothing she could do. She was in Tennessee, where there aren't many protections for workers. They can fire you because your hair is purple and they don't like the color of your hair. So in the moments, I was depressed. I'm like, what am I gonna do? How dare they treat me this way? I was a good worker. And then I was just like, how can I take my language and my education and take it to the next level for communities, my community that is not seen? So I joined Black Lives Matter. And then ever since then, I took off. Joining Black Lives Matter was how Lasaya found activism. And that transformation from being fired to becoming an activist, that's a familiar story for the trans folks we spoke with. I'm just literally coming to work, doing my job, and I don't know if I'm going to be fired or not. That's Diamond Styles. By the time she was fired from her job, her life was already shaped by racism and discrimination. My mother had been caught up in the prison industrial complex. As a Black woman, she was one of those super predators. We should probably explain super predator for folks who weren't around in 1992. Okay, yes, super predator refers to a now discredited theory from the 1990s. The idea that some people were just naturally violent and lacked empathy. Most of those so-called super predators were Black. The concept was made popular to the nation by the Clinton administration. They used that terminology in campaigns, ultimately passing a racist, tough-on-crime bill in 1994. They are not just gangs of kids anymore. They are often the kinds of kids that are called super predators. No conscience, no empathy. We can talk about why they ended up that way, but first we have to bring them to heal. And the president is asking... That fake science was part of a trend of mass incarceration of black and brown people. People like Diamond's mom. And so she got caught up in that, and I got custody of my brother. And so I'm at home, a single trans woman with an 11-year-old. As a Black trans woman, Diamond knew she had even more stacked against her. When I went to college, first trans person to go to Jackson State University, I didn't, I didn't plan to go there. I didn't know what the history was. I was just trying to, I was stuck in Walnut Grove, Mississippi, with my mom, who was going through an addiction. And I wanted to get out of this country rural town because this is not fun for me. <laughs> and so the only way I could go is to go to college. But living in a male dorm wasn't safe for Diamond either. People were trying to throw scalding hot water on me in the dorm, trying to burn me. I'm sitting here, I have no power in this situation. I'm just reacting to everything that's happening to me. She hoped that leaving college and moving out of a male dorm, things would get better. But I work for um, Healer Packard, and when my transness came out, one of my family members worked there, like a distant cousin, and she told people that I was trans. Her coworkers started harassing her. One of the supervisors lost their keys, and 
they gave me the keys to give it to the supervisor so they can take pictures of us interacting with each other and make fun of him. I didn't have any political recourse. I didn't have any legal recourse because of the state that I lived in. We didn't have the protection for trans people. And so I, I was forced into um, survival sex work at the time. And, you know, it just changed the trajectory of my life. I would love to be able to share with you the whole um, podcast because I, I am loath to stop at that point because of course the rest of the podcast talks about the journey that Diamond and Lasaya and um, other activists like Gabriel Foster and Ricky Mananzala took from experiencing injustice to connecting with um, other activists and beginning to build organizations and movements for justice. Um, and their story is incredibly um, powerful. But I wanna share with you a little bit about um, what that process of, of building it was like and, um, and how we are thinking about the podcast project moving forward. So I'm gonna turn things over for a moment to my, um, my colleague and co-conspirator, uh, Cass, and invite you to talk a little bit about um, how this project has been from your perspective. Mm -hmm. Hi, it's really um, nice to meet everyone. Um, I'm sorry I arrived just a, a little bit late, but um, I I know that you've gotten to just hear my um, one of my favorite pieces of work that I've ever made, and it's part in part because the stories are so powerful. Um, I wanted just to say a little bit about how making a podcast with oral histories and with archival stories is different from making other types of podcasts and radio that you might have heard. Um, in part, I want to highlight just how important it is that we have audio in the archive. It does something different than just turning on NPR and hearing one person interviewed. And from my perspective, because I was trained to make daily radio, um, I know exactly how that's different. So in the traditional model of news radio, like if you're hearing a story on NPR, a producer is gonna go looking for a particular type of story or a particular story. They might have in their mind, oh, there's a new piece of legislation that's gonna come out that's going to impact trans people in such a way. I need to go call someone who's gonna be impacted by that legislation. And a lot of times they're going to find an advocate who is on one side or the other of that issue. Um, they might even interview a lot of different people on background, so without even having the recorder on, until they find the right story. And that might be the person who knows all the facts about the bill, or that might be somebody who is particularly pithy and media savvy and trained at saying the right thing. Um, and those stories are good. But in oral histories, you're not going to look for the person with the right story because every individual story is valued for its own sake. And I think that's a really powerful difference from making news media versus making a document that's meant to be shared with the larger community. So on transcripts, our job is to bring out the stories that each person is telling, not to call around and find each particular part of a story that fits into our preconceived notions of what's important. So we're not starting with, there's a bill up in the state house that might impact trans people. We're going to trans people and saying, what's important to you? What do you need to share with the community? And what issues are front of mind when you think about your life and your experience? So working with the archival tape, working with Merle and Andrea as oral historians, I think we get a much better sense of the type of stories and issues that are compelling to these members of our communities. Um, and I just think it's been so wonderful to work with the archive in that way, because we start to see when stories are repeated. In the news, we might think, oh, this person has one dramatic story. We need to highlight that one dramatic story. And that's the real proof that there's some type of injustice. But with working with a large archive, I saw somebody in the Q&A saying that there's 200 people in this archive. There's tons of people in this archive. You actually get the sense that it's not the stories that stand out, that are different, that are important, or not just those stories. You start to see how patterns emerge. And so if, the, if people are affected by issues over and over again, like lack of housing, lack of solid employment, discrimination in their families, 
then you think, oh, it's not that this affects one person, it's that these are probably systems level issues if they're affecting so many different people in similar ways. So it just became a very powerful experience to listen through a large archive of audio, notice what people had in common, and then we can talk about these things more structurally and in a less sort of individualist, you know, maybe one person has this experience type of way. Um, so as a producer, again, there's just really different modes of telling stories. And we're so proud that the podcast has been able to do something that you might not hear just if you turn on, you know, a three minute story about trans people on NPR. And as we were beginning to think about how we would use these oral histories to produce um, a podcast, we had sort of two um, overarching goals. One was to tell uh, um, more nuanced and complicated stories about trans people and trans politics than the mainstream representations that we are often seeing on the news and in the media, which usually focus on um, legislative or, or legal um, cases and are very often focused very narrowly on things like what bathroom can people use. Um, and we wanted to um, think about the degree to which we centered a question. And the question was, so last year, as many of you I'm sure are aware, was one of the, the I think the most deadly year for trans people um, experiencing lethal bias violence. And nearly all of the people who were killed were trans feminine, and nearly all of them were trans women of color, Black, Latinx, and Indigenous trans women. And so we centered this question, what would it really take for, for trans women of color to be not just safe, but valued? And we recognize that the answer to that question is not, um, Title VII um, Supreme Court decisions about employment protect protections. It's not about what bathrooms people can use. For trans and gender fabulous people of color to be not just safe, but live you know, robustly joyful lives um, as valued members of our communities, it would take massive and profound changes to all of the systems in the US that are structured currently, not just by gender binaries, but by racialized gender norms, right? By racialized ideas about what bodies are normal and what bodies are healthy and what bodies are valued and welcomed and what bodies are seen, seen as threats, what bodies are seen as diseased, what bodies are seen as, um, un, as not valuable and as dangerous. All of those systems, whether it's schools, whether it's so the social safety net, whether it is higher ed, whether it's the healthcare system, whether it's the criminal justice system, are structured by those racialized gender norms. And so in order for trans women of color to have true safety and um, the room to have self-determination and joy, all of those systems would have to look fundamentally different. The other lesson that we wanted to really centralize in making this um, project is the idea that trans rights are not just about trans people and that the transformation of those systems wouldn't just make life better for trans people or wouldn't just make life better for trans women of color. They would make life better for everyone because everyone is trapped and controlled by those racialized gender norms. Um, the punishment that those systems levy against people who transgress those norms is targeted and is more acutely felt by trans women of color. Um, but these are systems that use a combination of punishment and rewards. And so some people experience rewards for, um, for participation in those system and other people experience punishment, but all of us are controlled by them, right? And all of us would have, could live more capacious gendered lives were those systems less um, uh, forcefully controlling of our lives. And so those are the two lessons that we really wanted to centralize in, in the podcast. And we are hopeful that we will have the opportunity to create six more episodes 
that look at um, organizing around the criminal legal system, organizing around immigration, organizing around medical access, organizing around civil rights and um, community and art um, spaces that, that build and centralize trans joy. And so I hope that folks will have the opportunity to check out the um, website for the Transcript Podcast and stay tuned, sign up for our feed and stay tuned for the second episode, which will be um, released in early March. And now I'm looking forward to um, answering some of your questions along with Cass and, um, and Tim. Great, thank you, Tim, Merle and Cassius. And uh, we do have time for a few questions that are uh, coming in. Thank you very much, everyone, for sending those in. Um, the, the first one was that someone was interested in how these interview transcripts are being used for the, uh, for the trans community and uh, for scholarship. Uh, and then we have a couple of uh, other questions uh, after that, uh, Merle and Cassius, that are both uh, directed to your presentation. So if you want to check the Q&A after you answer that first one and, and pick those up. Absolutely. So um, I'm going to pop the um, website into the chat or into the Q&A in just a moment. Um, but the all of the... Um, Um, all of the interviews are available in on the um, UMedia platform, which is the library's um, platform, and they're being used in such um, a wide variety of ways. I think folks are beginning to use them in their scholarship, and I think folks are um, beginning to use them in community presentations. Um, I know that clearly folks are using them in, in radio and media because that's what we're doing with them. Um, but one of the great joys about the Oral History Project is that we don't even know how they're being used necessarily. Certainly some folks contact us, but because they're freely available, people are using them in, in projects and scholarship that, that we're not even aware of. Um, and so I look forward to seeing all the different ways um, that, that folks have begun to use them. The other question that I see is our decision um, to use, or my decision to use the word gender fabulous. And the reason I use it is because um, um, there are so many different ways to be gender expansive. Right, and some folks who are gender expansive identify as trans. Some folks don't, um, but their experience of moving through the world as folks who transgress those racialized gender norms, um, they will experience the the punishments that are targeted towards folks who transgress those gender norms, whether they identify as trans or not. Um, and so, I want to be inclusive of folks who um, transgress those gender norms whether or not they themselves identify as trans and also to reflect the fact that it's fabulous being trans. And um, although my gender comportment may be less fabulous than some, um, I, uh, we have had the opportunity to interview folks whose, um, whose gender truly is expansive. And in framing it that way, it makes us recognize the degree to which for many of us, those racialized gender norms tend to narrow and lock down our, um, our, our gender possibilities. And if we were to sort of unlock ourselves from those norms and think about how much more expansive our lives could be and how much more expansive the lives of young people coming up now are than ours were when we were young. I don't know if you wanna to add to that, Cass. Yeah, I just remember um, when we interview people, we ask people what use that what words they use to describe themselves. And there are so many different words, and some of them include words like gender fabulous that I don't personally use for myself because I think I'm very gender boring. But for those of us who use different language, we want to respect that in the show. 
So one principle of making the show is that even though we're the ones who might be editing the script before we release it as a podcast, we want to retain the way that people talk about themselves as much as we possibly can. We think that's the right thing to do for representing them. So if people use words like gender fabulous, that might not be the words that you'll hear all the time if you're following these issues. Um, we still think it's important to introduce listeners to new ideas if they're the words and ideas that come from the folks who are um, giving their time to be on the podcast. Tim, it so looks I see like some of the next questions are for you. Sorry. Yeah, I've got uh, a question. Are all the Frederick Dorr Steel illustrations held by the U digitized? Um, archivists and curators um, are, are, we never say all, because <laughs> there's always something that's going to uh, pop up. Um, I would say many of them are, um, uh, but uh, I think there are still some lurking that we haven't uncovered yet. Um, uh, Steele did illustrations in other magazines. Um, beyond the Sherlockian world. I think there's some there that have yet to be captured. Um, so I won't say all. Uh, I will say a healthy percentage uh, of them have been digitized and are in U Media. Uh, and uh, when you're in U Media, you can do a search, just uh, search under Frederick Dorr Steele, and that will pull up most of, the, of those images. Uh, you can also limit your search uh, to uh, special collections and rare books, the Sherlock Holmes collection to, uh, to provide a filter. Um, but that's where you'll find them. Um, and I, I just also want to make just a general comment. I'm, I'm so appreciative of, of Merle and, and Cass's um, presentation today because I think it, it highlights, along with Sherlock, um, the way <clears throat> that the University Libraries uses various platforms, be it podcasts, or social media to be both informative and transformative. And there is so much power um, there uh, on those various platforms. So I just wanna say thank you for your presentation um, because I think it's, it's a, a great uh, window into what the library strives to do in terms of both informing people about various things, but also transforming. Um, people uh, and, and moving us in a, in a positive, uh, better way. So thank you. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. If anyone has a question that they would like to share in the Q&A for any of our presenters, we'll be happy to take that. Just give a second here for people to type just in case. One thing I'll, I'll just also mention, I, f I forgot to say at the top of my presentation, I hope you were reading the, the texts on the post. I transcribed those into the slides instead of just using a screen capture from the slides uh, as I was posting those. So I hope you were able to catch some of those as I was narrating. All right, at this point, it looks like we don't have any additional questions. So I just want to thank again our presenters and our ASL interpreters. Thank you, everyone. Um, and then invite all of you in the audience to join us again online on March 5th for a presentation from the Wagenstein Library. Uh, exhibits allow the University of Minnesota libraries to share their collections and engage communities. Darren Terpstra, Archives and Special Collections Exhibit Design and Project Specialist, and Lois Hendrickson, Curator at the Wangenstein Historical Library of Biology and Medicine, will share ideas on how to mount a successful exhibition with emphasis on opportunities to meet the challenges of online exhibits. So thank you again to everyone. Remember to check the library's YouTube channel in a few weeks for a recording of today's presentations and we will see you again next month.